While doing research for my previous video, there are a few things I noticed in a recent pirate software stream. I won't directly show the stream because... But I will paraphrase some of the things he said on stream. So here's a screenshot of his IDE, and this was streamed on July 6, around the 4 hour and 7 minute mark on the YouTube video. And he's discussing how he implements dialogue, and then a chatter asks him, why don't you use JSON to do this? And his answer is, arrays are super fast, that's the only reason. And then he goes on to explain a bit more, and then a chatter says, well these are string tables, this is what iOS does. And he says, yes, string tables are super normal in the industry, especially for localization. While it is true that string tables are used in the industry, this is not a string table, it's an array. And so the distinction here is that tables contain key value pairs, while arrays contain index value pairs. And since the chatter had mentioned iOS specifically, this screenshot is from the Apple developer docs, where dot strings files are specifically stated to contain key value pairs. And this distinction matters because in something like an array structure, the identifiers for the data are integers. And there's no real way logically at mass scale, like in the case of a dialogue intensive story driven RPG. At that scale, there's really no way to logically bind integers to sentences. So in this example, in this cutout of his code, there's no way to know what 124 means or 125. You can't really take a number and assign meaning to that as a sentence. Whereas in a real string table, the identifiers match the type of the data. We have string identifiers labeling string data. So then you logically can tie the identifier to the value. If I have a sentence that is supposed to be the final words of a character named Gus, I can tag the identifier for that sentence as Gus's final words, and so on. And to use JSON format as an example, because that's what the chatter mentioned on stream, you can nest the logic so that all the translations for a given sentence sit in the same place. So whenever I need to look it up with a string identifier, I can nest that with a language identifier and then during gameplay the language identifier is some sort of enum value that the player picks in the settings and then that variable is used in tandem with the actual identifier for the sentence so now the code itself doesn't have to go looking in different places for a given sentence depending on the language. Another nice thing about this nested structure is that if a certain sentence is missing like we can't find the Mexico translation for Hector's final words, we can default to the English sentence that's right next to it. And all of that fallback logic is localized to where we already were. We don't have to traverse the data structure very far to get the backup plan. What he says on stream is that they have English loaded just in case. So what I assume that means is the entire localized array is loaded in memory and then the entire English array is also loaded in memory. Nesting can also be modular, so maybe you don't want every possible translated version of the sentence in memory. You can just rearrange the structure of the nesting to fit however you want it to work. So in this example, we pick the language first and then we only get the one translated sentence we need at that moment. Whereas the array is the array. <laughs> See what we mean now when we say flat? It just, it is what it is. And as far as performance considerations go, I will brazenly invoke the Fallout 4 Pete Hines tweet from hell on this and just say that if you have some kind of baking function in your loading process where the entire array, even if it is or isn't in memory all at once versus parts of a dictionary or a giant dictionary. The difference there, given a known identifier, it just is not critical in a dialogue-driven RPG game. The nanosecond, probably, difference between the two is just not relevant like it would be in like a high-frequency trading algorithm where nanoseconds are worth $10 million. 
it just doesn't matter. The the DevX trade-off and the localizer experience trade-off, which we're about to get to, it is more than worth whatever performance advantage you may or may not even be getting there. Another bonus of using something like JSON is because it's more modular and developer friendly, that makes it more friendly for developing on platforms outside of just your own game. So for example, you could very easily plug a JSON into a schemaless database of some sort and then hook that up to a web portal and then have your translators use the web portal as a non-technical way to keep up with what they're translating and to have kind of a common place to look at with what's in progress and what you're actually putting in the game. And instead of that, what he said on stream is that they use GitHub. And so the localizers have to submit pull requests in order to update their work with the game files. And I mean, clearly that works because they're, they're doing it. That's what they're doing. But compare this to, you know, how you got to teach them what Git is at some level, what GitHub is at some level versus hey, here's your username and your password that I gave you. When you log into this website, you'll see just the Japanese stuff or just the Russian stuff. And it's plug and play. You can update it and revise it as you want. And another thing I'll add, just to be totally clear on this, he's not like mistreating them <laughs> by making them do this. Okay, he, I mean, he said on stream he pays them over what the industry pays, and I believe that. Um, so it's not like, I, I don't mean like this is bad, bad. I just mean, why are you teaching them Git? <laughs> like, just make a website. Another key takeaway from the stream is that he mentions Obsidian, which is a note-taking app. And he says that Obsidian is a massive help in writing. Well, Obsidian is a note-taking app that lets you organize your notes in an undirected graph which we may also call a tree, which has hierarchy. And specifically, you can see this screenshot he shows. This is from their website. You can see the graph structure that it provides. So then the question is why, other than performance, which we already covered, why is your logic structure not native to your data structure? The data structure is flat, but the way we're organizing it is hierarchical. And to go ahead and give my closing thoughts on this, I uh, actually changed my mind. Um, last video, I said he should do a refactor, which in this case would be like a rewrite. But after seeing how his dialogue is also an array in addition to his story flags, um, at this point I say just go heads down and just go for it, uh, just get it done. Um, if you've already adapted to this workflow, it's like self-induced vendor lock-in, <laughs> but like, uh, just you just gotta go with it at this point, I think. I, I do think it would take too long to rewrite, especially if this is what you've been doing for years. Um, just roll with it. The other side of that, though, is this has become kind of like an albatross around his neck. I don't think he wants to work on this anymore, and I don't think that's like even necessarily indicative of his character to say that. I would not want to work on this if it was like this. I think, you know, he has a lot of eyes on him right now, friendly and non-friendly. And I think he really wants to just be the guy that finishes it. If I were him, I would take like an executive producer position on this. I would hire a dev or multiple devs have them rewrite it so it's easier to finish and then still have creative control but have the actual management of the game be outsourced to other people and just pay them for it just to get it out because there's not enough time there's not enough time between working on the minecraft mod that he's doing interacting with chat as a streamer uh, playing games as a streamer. There's not enough time to commit to this. The way it's structured, it is so cumbersome to work on. Just having you think about this, you're tapping between Obsidian, your dialogue file, 
your whatever this Excel sheet he showed that I covered in my last video, the other progress Excel sheets, all of the work is distributed in different places that you have to manage mentally. Yeah, I mean, that's that's not indicative of someone's intelligence to say that that is very taxing to deal with and not fun or interesting or invigorating to work on. Um, I think he needs to, I think the, the W here is to hand it off, give people a job that, that makes you look good. Give someone or a group of people a job and just hand it off and then release the game. Fulfill your promise to the, I almost called them <laughs> shareholders, the people that backed the game in early access, the people who have purchased it on Steam and just get, get it off. You got to get rid of this thing, man. Okay, thank you very much for making it to the end of the video. I really appreciate your viewership. This will be my last video on pirate software, unless any crazy software related drama with him happens again. I won't be doing further content on this subject, which means my next video will be an analysis on Elden Ring Night Rain. So if that interests you, be sure to subscribe and stick around for that. Thanks again for watching and y'all have a good one.